So this is an interesting thing about what is probably a cornerstone of the organization of brain activation states and creative people, mm -hmm. uh, people who are you know naturally or spontaneously creative, and that is that um, they tend to have um, more um, widespread connections um, explored um, and maintain more um, random connections right. than um, maybe the most efficient. Right. Uh, we just did a brain imaging study of what we call big C. Uh, creatives, people who are just unbelievably great scientists, right. unbelievably great artists, as acknowledged by their peers and, mm -hmm. you know, as, as documented by their work being, you know, widely recognized and exhibited internationally, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah. Um, and what we found is that, um, you know, when we did functional uh, imaging studies um, and then we looked at the network organization. And when we look at brain network organization, we can use a number of tools that come from graph theory and they're pretty cool helping to understand what's talking to what in the brain. Mm -hmm. A good analogy of those little maps you get when you're flying about the airline routes, like you can see that like LAX, Los Angeles is big airport. It's a major hub. You got a lot of stuff coming out of there. And you see there's, you know, Dallas, there's Miami, there's Atlanta, there's New York, there's Chicago. These big hubs tend to be where a lot of flights are coming in over long distances. Right. But then you've got the regionals where you know, you've got local flights that are spreading out. Now, this is a very efficient network organization mm -hmm. that enables us to get from um, you know, Burbank to Duluth. Um, but we have to go to LAX right. and uh, you know, Minneapolis first, yeah. right? Now, what we found in the, in the brains of the, of the big C creative people, these exceptionally creative people, is that they would take direct routes, like private planes, uh -huh. from Burbank to Duluth. Yeah. They'd have a direct connection there uh -huh. that you know was probably rarely going to be used, but they were happy to explore it. Uh -huh. um, they were able to make those leaps and go directly from point A to point B. So what we see is that's the ability to generate unique nodes of activation in places and connect them together and determine whether they're going to be useful or not. Right. This is probably a hallmark of creativity. Right. And same with the word list. If you give people two words that somebody else may think is not related because it's not part of the habitual linked pattern, right. but they may say, oh yeah, I can see the pattern there. Right. Yeah. Now I wonder um, that, you know, that study, certainly these very creative people have been being very creative for a while, right? They're not just come out of the womb and they're just spun and you do an fMRI and you find that, you know, there's this, they, they're taking these shortcuts and connections, right? Right. Um, certainly, there's probably an element of creating for over an extended period of time, mm -hmm. right? And a neuroplastic function that 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 does to the brain, right? Yeah. In the sense of like, well, they pro maybe they form that connection from just trying to form that connection by being creative over such an extended period of time. Yeah. So uh, there's a big chicken egg problem in a lot of brain research on creativity right now mm. where, you know, we see these differences in people who are identified in groups of being highly creative versus, you know, not so creative. And uh, we don't know whether those changes have been the product of the experience or there's some kind of a genetically preordained process. Like right. we have a study of visual artists. We find they've got these big centers in their high level visual cortex. Mm. I mean, the, the brain is actually bigger. Yeah. They have more gray matter there. So we're wondering, well, is it because, and I think this is probably the right answer, because they've been spending decades doing visual art. They've right. been processing things visually and right. uh, they've been exercising those bits of their brain. And yeah. we now know that cognitive exercise does beef up the neurons in those regions, right. whether it leads to the production of new neurons, less likely, but to the proliferation of other processes that are connected with the neurons, yeah. the growth of the cells and their, their, their subprocesses, yeah. um, that definitely happens. So I think that's most likely, but there probably are also some genetic mm -hmm. uh, precursors yeah. that enable regions of the brain to be bigger, yeah. but uh, that experiment hasn't been done. But I think uh, that's an <laughs> important point to drive home, right? It's like people just aren't born create, maybe they are born predisposed to creativity, mm -hmm. right? But people aren't just born and they just start creating, right? Like creativity is something that you have to work at. Mm -hmm. Just like memory is something you have to worry. Just like all these other cognitive functions are something that you have to work at so that your brain gets more efficient at, you know, if it's remembering stuff, um, one thing, that's one thing, you know, but creativity, just like the same thing, right? Where it's like your brain, starts forming those connections to optimize creativity, mm -hmm. right? I think so. I think there probably are some genetic predispositions to be able to be more flexible 
or to identify novel solutions, you know, somewhat better than others. There's probably a range of, of human abilities that's sort of built in genetically. But I think that a lot comes from experience and the context and setting in which you're living. Mm -hmm. 